Welcome to our series, Discussions on Democracy. I'm Elaine Engelhart from Utah Valley University, and we, with the Center for the Study of Ethics, have dreamed for years to put on a series on democracy, where in an interdisciplinary fashion, we could look at numerous aspects of this very important process in our government. So today, our discussion is going to focus on poetry and war. And with us, we have three veterans who are all going to give us their point of view. But our guest is Ken Regal, a poet from Charlottesville, Virginia. Next to me is Lisa Beaudry, and then Ken Regal from Charlottesville, Virginia, and Wayne Hanowitz, who is a professor at Utah Valley University. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about Ken, and he can tell you a little bit more about himself and also um, read you a couple of his poems. Uh, he was a veteran of the Vietnam War. He joined uh, when he, uh, he had just finished one semester of college and decided that he needed to be part of this. He joined and insisted on going to Vietnam. It changed his life. He came back, finished his bachelor and two master's degrees, but discovered that with the invasion of Iraq, that poetry was one of the few things that could really soothe him as he thought about his war experiences. Ken has published his works in uh, several areas, and he has also uh, spoken at numerous institutions and helped veterans across the country as they work through their own, uh, their own issues with war. Lisa is a student at Utah Valley University, and um, she's uh, uh, also a mom of six. Lisa uh, was a Marine and uh, uh, learned, how, learned from her, her own experiences in the Marine Corps how to be a proper Lady Marine, and she'll tell us a little more about that. And then Dr. Hanowitz, Wayne, uh, has been in military service for more than 25 years and still does some active duty and he's been involved in numerous branches of government in fulfilling his assignments, in many of them in special operations. So Ken, I'd like to turn the time over to you for a little bit, and would you like to uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and introduce um, a couple of poems, poems that you're going to read to us? Well, thank you. Um, yes, I would. Um, one of the more recent uh, poems uh, that I have written because the Vietnam experience, because it unfolded rather slowly on me and over a period of years, and really only came to light with the invasion of Iraq when I began to really feel uh, about what life was going to be like for the men and the women who were going across the desert toward Baghdad. And I thought about uh, my own experience, and I began to realize that, that I was so troubled by this, and I, I began to try to uh, put into words some understanding for myself. And even in the process of writing through a three-year period, uh, that as I was writing, this was written late in 2006, and I began to realize and interpret my own experience as one, as what I call a parallel existence. And so the poem is simply called Parallel Existence. We live in two separate worlds, you and I. I live a parallel life within myself. A part of me perished in Vietnam. What you see of me longs to reunite with that unseen departed one. I don't remember my date of death. I didn't know anything was wrong until I returned. We live a parallel existence, you and I. It has been told to me I am a person of depth, then why do I feel so hollow inside? You say I am digging my own grave? There is my depth. I am too deep for my own good. There is an invisible part of me. I fail to live up to all expectations. We live in a parallel existence, you and I. It's the least you can do. You should know this by now. What's wrong with you? You did it. You're the guilty one. But I ask, do you understand the least I can do? Do you know what I know? Do you know what is wrong with me? Do you know what I have done? Do you understand what you are doing to me? We live in a parallel existence, you and I. Five people in a thousand, 50, 
people in 10,000, 500 people in 100,000. All the others lie cold in the ground. You call them heroes because they died. They no longer point the finger in condemnation. We live parallel lives, you and I. A wall of separation keeps us apart. I cannot cross over to you. You will never come to me. I live a parallel life with one foot in Vietnam, with one foot in the present day. I can no longer identify which one is true. Perhaps both worlds are false. But I survive in this parallel existence, searching for the reunion of the part of me that can believe in your world again. Thank you, Ken. That's a, a, an extraordinary poem. And we find that your poetry is very stimulating and soothing for many veterans. It doesn't really matter the war. Can you explain this impact, um, why your poems seem to touch the lives of especially veterans? I think that I played around with this in my mind over the years and, and that there were episodes, you know, maybe in the beginning once a month or once a, in a three-month period, and that there would be certain uh, situations in my life where, where the, the, the feeling of Vietnam would, would come up, would uh, just kind of bubble up inside of me. And, and, I, I, and just through, the, the, through, even through my education process in you know, sociology and the religious studies and American studies and so forth, in reading about other people's experiences and being able to more clearly define what was happening to me. And so, so when it really uh, kind of erupted in, on March 19, 2003 with the invasion of Iraq, I had thought through this so often and had uh, interviewed World War I and World War II veterans as a folklorist. And, and, so, and I understood their, their, uh, their particular situations and, and, and their, what had happened to them and how they felt about their life. And so I think that I was able to refine the words, and I was doing it for self-therapy, a, a therapeutic for myself. I never intended anyone else would ever read these words. And uh, I was seeing a man who was helping me work through some of the anxiety about, about Vietnam. And, and I, I would take the poems and I would allow him to read them. And then he said, can I read these to other people that I'm, I'm dealing and counseling with? And I said, sure. And, and, and the more he did that, and he would come back and say, they really like this. And, 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 and these were all Vietnam veterans. Uh, at that point, because with the invasion of Iraq, you know, they just they were flooded by Vietnam veterans coming in, and I need to talk to somebody about this because they were in such pain and trauma from their own experience and recognizing here we go again, it's going to happen all over again, and I don't want this generation of soldiers and Marines to be ignored the way we were, and so I think that it resonates because it's gone through that filter. Wayne, maybe I can ask you to respond as a, a veteran. What is it that appeals to you about Ken's poetry? It's hard to capture the experience of warfare in, in normal language. And what I think the gift of poetry and, and art <clears throat> is that it gives a, provides space for the hearer uh, to imbue the experience with meaning and with context. And, and that's what makes it come alive. It, you, there's only so much you can do with normal language. The experience of killing and dying is way over the top of language, and for that reason alone, I think poetry and art capture much better. And Lisa, anything <coughs> that you'd like to add to what uh, Wayne or Ken have said about that, or how, um, how our arts and literature can help in times of trying to sort out emotions? Well, as a, as a non-Vietnam uh, veteran, I have to say that I am profoundly grateful to Ken for his poetry and the way he's helping to heal um, the brothers and sisters that, that I have in the military family. That uh, it's, it's heartening to know that they're finding some closure and some relief through the words that he's put on paper. Oh, thank you. Would you read another favorite poem for us, Ken? Sure. Um, I got to know uh, many Vietnamese people, but but one particular man uh, who I only ever actually talked to on the phone, and the one of the 
kind of amazing things or humbling things about being in Vietnam. This, this man was a Viet Cong, and he actually was able to penetrate into our camp and tap into our phone lines. And since I was usually the guy with the phone, I, about anywhere between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, the phone would ring, and I would pick it up, and it would be this guy speaking perfect English. And, you know, and he was threatening, you know, very threatening. I'm gonna, we're coming after you, and or we're going to go get your wife. And I said, well, I'm not married. And he said, oh, okay, we're going to get your mother and dad. Maybe your girlfriend. And I thought, where does he get all of these words? And so that, that was a profound, in, in the, and this happened over and over again throughout the year that I was there. And so I wrote a poem about this man. It's called Phone Calls in the Night. I love the night sky in Vietnam. For many, it exposes the terror. We may own the day, but they rule the night. I never think of dying. My, fo my thoughts focus on those who are dying. Names, not faces, fill the pages of the casualties I see every day. The darkness provides the cover for those who bring death to us in the night. I walk away from the vans beyond the safety of the lights. I look up into the night sky, the southern hemisphere brilliant with stars. They are never far away. They would kill me, I know. He calls on the phone to tell me so. Victor, Charlie, play coup next you. I refuse to be afraid. Where did you learn to speak English, I ask? University of Chicago. He has more education than I. Just a simple life I seek. The motives are, uh, for war are much too complex for me. The questions I want to ask him are the questions he will ask me. We speak only by phone in the middle of the night. And so I say, call me again soon. I'd really like to talk now. That's really a fun one. Uh, Wayne, what are, what, are, what are your thoughts about this poem? And also, what are some of the things that, that kind of come home with people that just stay with them, like this phone call of threats and other things? Uh, it's, it's, I don't know if I can generalize, but th this is a great story. Uh, I, I, I've had experiences like that, and I know others have had, where there's something that seems counterintuitive to being in war, mm -hmm. that, that uh, something stands out among people. And they both reach across this line, this, this psychological and emotional line and, and political line, and they make a, a human connection. And for a lot of these people, it's after the war, they make a real connection. They, they go back and they try to track each other down. These are great stories, and, and, I, and I haven't had the time to do this, but there's a lot of meaning in those stories, and they need to be taken care of somehow. Uh -huh. So even you think maybe you might even write some of your own stories? Too old. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm trying to trap you now that we're on TV no, no, cameras no, yeah, so that yeah, I can see some of these stories. <laughs> How about you, Lisa? Is it a time that you like to forget about, uh, or do you have ways of remembering it? Um, my ways of remembering the, the Vietnam era, I were talking, uh, I wasn't very old. <laughs> And um, actually, my ways of remembering it are when I became a teenager and an older teenager, some of my older friends had experienced and had even gone uh, and, and been soldiers in Vietnam. And then when my mother remarried, she remarried a, a captain in the Army, and he had served two tours. And um, as, I, as I listened to Ken, he also has another poem about people that he met there. And I just remembered that the one thing I have heard my stepfather say about being in Vietnam was how hard it was because you did get to know the people. And yet at the same time, he tells a story of how frightened they were, his, his platoon was, of the locals because even a child would come up to them with a grenade and then hurt them like a suicide bomber. And so even though they wanted to reach out because it seemed... That, that their neighbors wanted to reach out to them, there was tremendous fear, and they couldn't, and they had to be fearful for their own lives so they could go back home. And that seems to me an incredibly tragic, mind, heart-altering uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Because any of us, when we travel, we love to meet the locals. Oh, we wow. love to get to know the people. And, and what a hard thing to go to an area where you, you couldn't feel comfortable with that. So true. 
Um, Ken, you and Wayne were both um, quite early in the Vietnam War. Uh, you, you had some lessons learned be, that you could share with uh, other soldiers along the way uh, down. But why don't you go ahead and read another poem for us and then tell us about kind of the early days of being in Vietnam. To respond to what Lisa just said there about meeting the locals and children, uh, I have another story similar to the one about the phone calls. It's called One Vietnamese Boy. And it starts out, I'm in panic. Now, I'm by myself, and I'm in a place where I shouldn't be because it's like off limits to us. But I like to go here, uh, out here. It's in the woods, and away, away from our base. It's on the other, actually on the other side of the city of Natrain. So one Vietnamese boy, I am going to die. That's what I think. I can't believe this. I walked right into it. A boy lies on the altar before the large stone Buddha. Do they offer human sacrifices? My eyes flash in every direction. I expect VC with AK-47s. I'm not supposed to be here, always before a place of tranquility. I am going to die. Where are they? The boy is a decoy. He lay dead on the altar before the large stone Buddha. His eyes open. His head turns. He smiles at me. He is alive. Should I kill him? I can't do it. I am going to die. If they are going to kill me, they will just have to do it. I can't kill him. He's just a boy. He sits on the altar before the large stone Buddha. Now he is walking toward me. This is very dangerous. Don't come near me. I am frozen with fear, but I am ready to die. He reaches out to me. There is no one here, just the two of us. He can't speak English. I can't speak Vietnamese. For the next two hours, there is no war. I think I find him, but he, with the Buddha, waits for me to come. Oh. That's really lovely. What was it like in the um, early days of being in Vietnam? When I got there, it, you know, it was the Battle of Idrang in November 65 almost just committed me that I, I needed to be a part of this. I, I had bought, I bought, purchased a car in October of 1965 because of a job, and I, I bought a license plate that said, uh, support our boys in Vietnam. And because I was so uh, negative on the attitude of most people and I thought we should even if you didn't believe that we should be there you can't blame the guys who were drafted or even enlisted who went there and so I enlisted and I went and I volunteered uh, while I was at Fort Gordon I volunteered to go to Vietnam and he said we can make that happen for you and sure enough within a couple weeks I had my orders to go and and I was so proud when I got there It was very small we were living in tents and there were you know sandbags everywhere and a lot of sand and 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 and, and I wrote home and just you know, signed my name US Army Vietnam it was just I was really really proud and you know that that got weathered you know and it deteriorated over a period of time as as experiences went on and I saw in, in during that period of time uh, I saw more and more in the base get bigger in the bases because there was a special forces camp our camp and the Air Force and it got bigger and bigger and bigger and it really changed began to change the complexion of the whole thing but the early days was really a very tight group of people that I thought was really a unique experience for me. Wayne how is it that maybe some folks could idealize war in the beginning but then the the hard truth is very difficult when they get home and and find that they're a different person. I think the the reason that people change is there's not a way to conceive of what war is like if you haven't been in it. You you can't really read a book and even any movie you can't really it's not the same as knowing that your life might end or that you're going to be responsible for taking another. It's one thing to hear it, see it on a screen. It's another to be there. If you wouldn't mind, uh, there is a little story that might be useful, but it's not about Vietnam. It happened in Afghanistan. And well, most of my experiences with small groups of people. I had a friend, a firefight broke out up in the mountain about five in the afternoon. There were four or five Taliban in the house, but they'd taken over the house and the family was still in there. And, and there were six or seven seals around the house. And uh, the, the firefight continued and, and usually over time, uh, the seals usually do pretty well with shooting. They're, over time, it wears it down. They they end up pretty well, but the, but it gets dark, and and by eight o'clock it was dark, and everyone was still in the firefight. And of course, you have night vision equipment, but when all that 
all the barrel flashes are going, muzzle flashes are going. It blinds you with that, so it's, it's sometimes not very helpful. So it kept going on, and of course, at that point, you're firing at uh, muzzle blasts and tracers or whatever's being used. Uh, and this went on, and then it, it stopped about 3 o'clock in the morning, and somewhere about 5.36 was enough light to, we could see what happened, and, and all the Taliban were dead. But somewhere in the middle of the night, uh, one of the guys, one of the Taliban had picked up a child and held him in front of him. And of course, the, the, the person shooting at him didn't know, you couldn't see that. And he, had, he shot through the child and killed the Taliban guy. Uh, and he had two kids about the same age. He, he had to be taken, he had to go home right away. And in fact, he couldn't go home. They put him up in an apartment in Virginia for a couple months. He, he couldn't even go home. And that was the end of that. That was the end of that for him. I mean, he, he still works, mm -hmm. but he can't do that right now. And it's been a couple of years. And, I, and the, the, the nightmares are very painful. There's, there's, there's the, the flip side of reaching out and making a human connection. It can be very painful, okay. especially when you don't, when you're part of it and it's not what you intended to happen. And this was probably someone with. Um, Quite a bit of field experience. Oh yeah, yeah. The, yeah. There's, it takes three, three to four years to have enough even to get into combat with the with the team, but it was hard for him um, to make that comeback. He just could not do it. it. It's a connection. The problem now is it, it's a connection he doesn't want to make anymore. Mm -hmm. It was just too much uh, hurt in that one. Lisa, last night I was watching the news and there was a battalion of National Guard leaving for another tour of duty, for many of them their second tour. And they interviewed some of them on camera, moms and dads. And it was hard for me to see the women who were leaving and tell about leaving their children behind. One dad in particular who was leaving behind a two, four, and six-year-old um, was said he's doing this, it's his duty, it's important, and he can hardly wait to be back to hold his children, but he'll be gone a year. How, how do you relate to that from your experiences? Well, at my experience as a parent and as a mother, um, this recent campaign in Iraq is the first that we've heard of where we've actually seen stories and seen people, mothers, leaving their children. Thirty years ago when I joined the military, the, mil the military was just starting to try to figure out a woman's role in the military other than a nurse and a secretary. And that is one of the reasons why I chose the Marine Corps, because in the, in the Army, uh, Everyone was a soldier. You weren't a man or a woman, you were a soldier. But in the Marine Corps, they were still differentiating male, female, high-class lady Marine versus Marine soldier. Um, I, I find it tragic and, and terribly saddening to see these mothers leaving children in the care of, of their mother, the grandmothers for a year, six months to a year. So much changes when I go out of town for a long weekend with my children let alone not seeing them for six months, and to leave and not know, will I come back at all? Mm -hmm. I, I cannot fathom the depth of feeling and emotion that they must be going through. And, and they're doing that because they believe, especially in the National Guard, especially an enlisted person in today's military, because they believe in what they're doing. Oh, thank you. Well, Ken, do you want to share another poem with us now? Yes. Uh, this poem, uh, during the, uh, I've, I've, I've had a lot of dreams, you know, that, that, that were ignited because of Vietnam, and this one is a, is a, is a dream, and, but it's, it's this kind of a unique uh, kind of, uh, of a dream, and, and uh, when I would wake up in the morning, I think, I thought, that sounds like a poem, so I would just simply write the dream down in poem form, and I will read the poem, and then I have, I'll give you some idea what I think that it might mean. It's called, We Were Building Sandcastles. The campground reminds me of Camp McDermott in Vietnam. I see Dan Summers, older now, playing with his granddaughter. He is my former trick chief. When did you leave the army? I ask. He mumbles his response. How long were you on active duty? Ten and a half years. I want to tell him how much I believed in our mission. Do you remember the night we came under attack? He simply shakes his head. He does not remember. Do you know what we were doing that day? We were building sandcastles, you and I. I leave him to follow the stream. I see a woman filling her coffee pot. The water is cloudy. 
She pours the water out. She refills the pot again. I want to tell her, fill it from the deeper water. She won't listen to me, I know. And now I understand. I don't want to drink the water anyway. Oh, that's a powerful dream, isn't it? Again, having gone to Vietnam early, I mean, I don't think there was a, a, a man, a soldier in my unit that was not trying to do what we were tracking NVA and in, in Viet Cong units. And we wanted to make sure that never again would a battalion of the 1st Cav or uh, the 4th Infantry Division run into a division of NVA and get uh, like they did at Iodrang. So that everybody would know, we would all be on the same page, everybody would know where everybody's at. And we were very good at what we did. But ultimately, we were building sandcastles, ultimately they would be destroyed. Mm, thank you. Very good. Wayne, tell us a little bit about dreams and uh, being affected by dreams. It'll be probably one of the last comments we'll get for this episode. Well, the, the dominant point is that we think we dream about our death, but we don't. Uh, there's always something in the back of our heads watching us die. And, and so the idea that we're really going to die, uh, when it comes out in dreams, it can't come out directly. So when you've experienced this, at least the friends I have and myself, it comes out, um, it may start out as, as a replication of the story that you've experienced, but, but there's so many different symbols that will take their place in your mind. You really need help often for someone else to have, sort of walk you through it, let you know what they mean and why they're having that effect on you. For me, it was a monster in a, in a Catholic, uh, I'm not Catholic, it was a monster in a Catholic religious store eating all the crosses. And uh, eventually, after a couple months of no, not sleeping very well and having this dream, uh, it, it turned out what it really meant is I, I had so much uh, anger and fear that, uh, that I didn't want to admit I had that. So only a monster could be that mad, you know. And so I had to it turns into something else to actually eat all these, all these moral rules, which were the crosses. I couldn't do that myself because I wouldn't allow myself to do that. It took a while to get there. Oh, thank you. That, that's really powerful. I'm so glad that we could have this discussion on democracy and that we can see that our hard-fought freedoms are still hard-fought, um, even from the past, uh, that we still work through uh, some of these tough times in the military. And uh, thank you, Ken, for coming out from Charlottesville and, and sharing your poetry. And thank you, Wayne, for sharing your experiences and insights, and Lisa as well. Thank you so much for giving of, of uh, your time and experience. Bye-bye.